this segment of the webinar is going to be addressing how do we take the things that John just showed us and apply them more directly in a world language classroom. Um, and we're going to be addressing three key issues here. The first is why high quality PBL is so powerful in a world language context. The second is a quick review of the elements of high quality PBL L projects, but with an eye toward what else they need to have in order to be considered high quality in a language education context. And then the third piece is um, some consideration of where project-based language learning projects are likely to break down in a world language context. So as John mentioned, um, there are a number of project design elements that are critical for high quality gold standard PBL. And since you've just talked about those, I'm not going to revisit them per se. But I do want to help us think a little bit about how do we move from PBL to PBLL, or more specifically, how do we get the language piece into project-based language learning so that we're helping our students move toward our ultimate goal, which is proficiency. Uh, in a world language context, high quality PBL needs three additional components. Number one is, of course, communication. And that would be opportunities to communicate interpretively, or in other words, to, in, uh, to acquire information through sustained inquiry in the target language. The second is culture and comparisons, or the idea, to, uh, the ability to spend time thinking about um, interculturality and to develop the pragmatic skills that they're going to need to successfully navigate their interactions in the target language. And then the third piece is content and communities, which tend to be a natural part of high quality, rigorous PBL projects, but sometimes we forget them when we're thinking about projects in a language education context. And so the content and the communities are what make the projects authentic or give them um, real meaning for students. Um, and the cultural authenticity is what gives the project uh, or gives students the opportunity to start to develop their intercultural skills. So PBLL is really powerful in world language education because unlike a textbook where a teacher is sort of left trying to bounce around from language to culture to all of the different pieces, PBLL provides a really clear framework for integrating all of those aspects of proficiency into a single powerful path. And those aspects of proficiency are um, sometimes invisible, uh, some of the invisible aspects as well. For example, it's very difficult to develop high levels of proficiency linguistically if students don't have a lot of content knowledge from other disciplines and can't discuss larger events going on in the world. It's very difficult to develop linguistic proficiency if you don't have critical thinking skills. How are students going to be able to hypothesize or um, do some of those higher order uh, functions with language if they don't also simultaneously develop the critical thinking skills. It's very difficult for them to use their proficiency effectively if they don't have opportunities to learn how to collaborate or how to take turns in a target language um, and things of that nature. So PBL helps us um, organize our instruction in a way that brings all of those threads together. So what constitutes a good project? Well, as John mentioned in his presentation, that kind of depends, right? It's not that some of the dessert projects he mentioned, like making a brochure or making a menu, aren't useful in helping students to practice language skills. However, if our ultimate goal is that students will develop high levels of linguistic proficiency and interculturality that enable them to communicate in the real world, then we might need to think more deeply about are we giving them real world opportunities to communicate? 
So we're going to extend the analogy a little bit and think for a minute about driving in general. Why are young people so anxious to get their driver's licenses? Well, the driver's license represents a number of things. It represents autonomy and independence. It means you don't have to rely on your parents to take you places. It means that you have the freedom to go explore and to do things when you want and how you want. Similarly, project-based language learning gives learners in a language um, context that those same uh, advantages, right? It helps them to be a little more autonomous and it helps them to be more independent and it gives them the freedom to really go and explore the world. And this leads us to thinking a little bit more about the differences between dessert projects versus high quality rigorous PDL projects. Um, dessert projects give learners opportunities to practice, right? But that practice tends to take place in a classroom, often with worksheets or really simple kinds of activities. And the problem with that is then they never get any real hands-on experience. And so you suddenly send them out into the world and they're crashing into everybody else's cars, right? They're making all kinds of cultural mistakes. They're making all kinds of, uh, you know, they don't have the confidence that they need in order to use their language in those real world settings. By contrast, high quality project based language learning projects provide learners with real world experience, hands on experience, using the language in real world settings for real uh, purposes and um, tasks. So John talked a little bit about the difference between a quote unquote doing projects and doing high quality gold standard project based language learning. We can add to that when we look at the actful 21st century skills map. So in language education, we have been trying to make similar shifts in the profession, right? So in the past students learned about language. Whereas today we want students to actually learn to use the language. And that has a lot of implications for our instruction, many of which I have underlined here um, because they apply directly to project based language learning. So if we want students to use the language, that means that we need to be focused more on the student with the teacher as the facilitator or collaborator rather than as the teacher delivering content. It means that they need opportunities to work on the three modes of communication, um, acquiring information, engaging in interactive conversations with others, and presenting or sharing the things that they've learned. It means that we need to start with the end in mind, with the emphasis on learners as doers and creators, or in other words, instead of planning lessons, we're going to think more about planning interesting experiences that will enable learners to develop the skills that they need. Um, it means that we're going to be using the language as the vehicle for teaching academic content rather than teaching the language. And that's a big shift for a lot of us. Um, it's not that we don't have some explicit instruction in grammar and vocabulary, but what a shift toward proficiency and the organizing framework of project-based language learning does for us is it gives us a framework where the primary focus is the content and the skills rather than um, simply studying the language. And that means that learners need real world, real world tasks that enable them to use that language outside of the classroom and that's where our public audience comes in, that they need opportunities to share and publish for authentic audiences. So what's really interesting to me about this 21st century skills map is that it aligns beautifully with the eight essential elements of high quality gold standard project-based language learning that John just presented to you. Um, and you can kind of see those parallels there. 
we want not only culturally authentic resources and materials, but also authenticity in terms of the work that students are doing in the classroom, uh, in the project, right? They're, that they're using real world tools to do real world tasks. Um, we want opportunities for them to engage in sustained inquiry and also in sustained use of the language. So rather than turn to your partner and you have three seconds to 30 seconds to have a little quick interchange, they're having meaningful repeated opportunities to use their language skills in progressively more complex ways. Now, all of that may seem kind of overwhelming, especially when we think about beginners. And throughout this webinar, we're going to be talking about how do we progressively build learners' competence uh, so that they can do these things. But I want to start by thinking about what we're asking them to do. So just as in an oral proficiency interview, for example, the as the prompt changes, the kind of language that that elicits from students also changes. The same thing is true of projects. So if what we're giving them are the hands-on kinds of projects, like John showed you, make a diorama, make a pinata, those things are not giving them, they're not eliciting as a general rule, the kind of language uh, practice or the kind of cultural interactions that students need to develop advanced levels of proficiency. If we step that up a notch, then we give them something specific to do with their language. And these tend to be dessert projects, right? So make a menu, uh, put together a little fashion show, so these are projects that give them opportunities to practice, but they don't necessarily require a whole lot of uh, use of real world content. And they don't necessarily connect to the real world in authentic ways. Then we step that up a notch and we start to get into projects that are maybe more main course projects. We're going to produce a class newspaper. Right, so that kind of a project requires them to start to integrate more content from the real world. It requires them to start to use some of the collaborative skills because this is something that they are going to be doing collaboratively as a whole group. It starts to have them using other 21st century skills such as creativity and critical thinking. And they're working on significant content. However, if we really want learners to have opportunities to engage in high quality project-based language learning, then our prompt starts to change. And we shift away from just a final product, although we keep that aspect, and we add to it sustained inquiry. So now the prompt becomes something like collaborate with, and you would insert a community partner here, collaborate with the local museum to investigate um, whatever it is that, that your significant content is going to be and develop a curated online exhibition for local elementary students, right? So students are having opportunities to collaborate with community partners in the real world to, and to use their communicative skills in all three uh, modes, interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational, in order to produce a product that is actually needed. And we're gonna look at some examples of that here in just a few minutes. So if we had to kind of summarize, what do high quality PBL projects have in common with high quality PBLL projects? Well, if you think about projects, each project is gonna be unique just like each of these cars is unique, right? However, there are a lot of features that these cars share that help us to see that they are vehicles for transportation, right? That they're all some genre of car. Even though we can see that the blue one maybe has a purpose that's more for entertainment, whereas maybe the middle one, the van, is going to be more functional for transporting um, you know, large numbers of people, each one is going to have its advantages, its affordances, 
and its constraints. Um, however, you'll notice that they all have headlights, they all have windshields, they all have tires. And we're going to look at what are some of the things that all high quality language projects are going to have in common. So the first thing that all high quality language projects are going to have in common is that they are going to engage students in authentic tasks for authentic purposes in ways that connect those learners to authentic audiences. Notice that the key here is authentic. And when we say authentic, I want to reinforce that we mean both um, culturally authentic and also authentic in terms of real world um, culture and real world uh, processes. So what's going to drive that authentic exploration? Well, the first piece is that we need a powerful engine, right? Your project's not gonna go anywhere if you don't have some kind of an engine to get it from one place to the other. And that engine is generally going to be your driving question. It can be a problem, it can be a challenge, it can be something that students are exploring, but in all cases, it's an issue that we want students to investigate. And more importantly, it's an issue that students care about investigating. We know that project-based language learning requires really rich fuel. So it's not enough to just come up with a guiding question. We also need to make sure that our guiding question is strongly connected to a meaningful purpose, that students experience and feel uh, internally a deep need to know about this thing that, or this issue that we have um, collaboratively selected. Now, in doing that, they're going to need a lot of skills that we typically would teach in a language classroom anyway, right? Um, at the lowest levels of projects, that tends to focus just on grammar and vocabulary. As teachers become more skilled, they start to realize, oh, if I start connecting what I want them to do with their grammar and vocabulary, in other words, those communicative functions, so that they can function in academic, different academic disciplines or regarding particular career focuses, that starts to increase our ability to move along in the project. When we start connecting those ideas to meaningful cultural contexts outside of the classroom, the project takes, takes on even greater power. When we add to that opportunities for students to really think critically and to evaluate things and to, to debate and to discuss, that increases the project yet another level. And when we do all of that within the context of the three modes of communication, then students have the full tank of gas that they need in order to go long distances in the real world. In other words, in a language classroom, high quality PBLL projects are geared to produce a useful project, or excuse me, product that fulfills a meaningful real world purpose. And they need linguistic proficiency and intercultural competence to do that. But that gets developed during the course of the project rather than a lot of dessert projects where we teach them all the grammar and vocabulary and then say, okay, now go make whatever. Um, the process becomes the learning instead of just a demonstration of the learning. And this is where our essential project design elements come in from gold standard PBL. Um, if the project is going to be meaningful, then a lot of times it means we have to make some tiny course corrections to our plans. That might mean we need to increase the challenge of our problem or question. It might mean that we need to tweak the design of the project so that students are repeatedly having to participate in inquiry. So maybe first they're going to investigate an issue by reading certain texts, right? By looking at blog posts or newspaper articles or doing some internet research. Then maybe that inquiry 
continues with um, interviewing native speakers from target cultures based on the information that they learned and the questions that that generated. And then maybe based on those interviews, that's going to cause students to have more questions, which they need additional information about. And so they are either going to go to maybe local community organizations or um, consult with their community partners. In other words, we have to set up our projects so that opportunities to continuously be engaged in sustained investigation um, are a piece of the project. Authenticity is probably the biggest place that I see a lot of projects in the world language classroom break down because we're really good at doing simulated kinds of tasks um, and we've called those real world for a long time in the profession but a simulation just like a student in driver's ed being in the simulator is a way different experience than being out on the road where random people are popping out in front of you um, you know and lights are changing and there are all these different distractions the real world is a much more complex um, situation so that does not mean that we don't use simulated activities to prepare students for doing the project but what it does mean is that we might need to tweak the authenticity of what we're asking students to do in order to better prepare them to actually use their language in real world settings. Um, and then the other one that I really want to highlight here is the idea of critique and revision. So that instead of students being given an assignment and they generate the product and then we're done and they get a grade, the idea that they have ongoing opportunities to receive feedback and to revise the things that they are producing so that over time, what they produce is really worthy of public sharing or consumption. And this is a place where community partners can really help us. Just like in a um, NASCAR race, you are going to have a pit crew that helps you change out the tires and helps you ma maintain or ensure optimal performance of the car. In order to ensure optimal performance in our projects, we have to get outside of the idea that as teachers, we are isolated in our own little classrooms. We have to start realizing that it's okay to reach out to the community as well as to colleagues for support, but also for their expertise. And that might include people like local community centers or businesses who have uh, target language speakers as a part of their operations. It could be museums or subject area experts. Um, really your imagination is the limits of your imagination will um, constrain or open up new opportunities for your students as you start to realize that there are lots of ways they can interact with real people um, both in your local community and in communities abroad as they participate in the projects and then finally we need to remember that we need feedback feedback for our students who are the drivers of the project ideally and that can come in the form of lots of the tools that are already well established in the profession Formative assessments, can-do statements, um, things that help us to gauge motivation and content, which you know, are generally going to be different types of formative assessments, and then integrated performance assessments, which often make very nice a way to structure a PBLL project for our students. So to summarize, um, because we're almost out of time for this segment, what is it that high quality projects have in common? They're going to have a powerful engine, which is generally the problem, question, or challenge that generates or elicits sustained inquiry and sustained linguistic performance. They're going to be steered by a meaningful purpose, geared to produce both proficiency and a useful product a product that's going to be useful to our public audience um, and potentially to our community partners as well. 
um, but they'll certainly be supported by the community partners. And they're going to provide us with feedback about the process as we go. In other words, when these pieces are all in place, they really motivate learners to take autonomous action. You will find that learners start working on projects on their own, that they want to be engaged in these things, not just as homework, but because they actually care about what they're doing. And this is a place where a lot of dessert projects tend to break down in language education. One of the questions we've gotten a lot of in previous webinars is, well, how do I make sure that students stay motivated? My students quickly lose interest. And what I would suggest is that a lot of times that's because what we're giving them to do is not anything that's particularly, uh, they don't see a lot of personal relevance to their own lives or opportunities to actually do anything that is real or a part of the real world. Um, we're gonna conclude this segment by quickly talking about how and why some of these projects tend to break down in a language classroom. And then in the next lesson, we'll be looking at some sample projects. So those of you who are saying, well, yeah, I got this, but I'm, I'm a little panicked because I still haven't seen any really good examples. We're going to start um, looking at that in just a minute. So one of the biggest places that projects break down is that we don't align them very well. We can come up with some kind of problem or question or challenge. I just use the, the word problem because it fits nicely with the piece, to be quite honest. Um, but sometimes we don't align that very well with a meaningful real world purpose. Or we have a meaningful purpose and a, and a really challenging problem but what we're asking students to produce doesn't really accomplish the purpose. Or in other cases, the project breaks down because the product that we're having students produce isn't actually useful to the public audience we have asked students to prepare to share it with. So alignment of those four issues is going to be really important in a PBLL project. The other giant place that things tend to break down in language education projects is that we forget that the purpose is proficiency. So we do a beautiful job of giving them meaningful things to do and they have great community partners and they really enjoy doing the work, but we haven't thought through the language use carefully enough. And so either what ends up happening is students become super frustrated because we haven't strategically organized and sequenced project tasks so that they build language skill or cultural um, you know, proficiency in, in terms of their ability to navigate the pragmatics of the situations that they're engaging in, or we simply leave out the language altogether. And so learners don't develop the skills that they need um, and that they're in our classes to develop. The world readiness standards can be a great tool for helping us to evaluate our projects. And you can literally just walk yourself through the five C's. I'm going to kind of quickly skim through these because you can read these later. But basically, when it comes to communication, we're looking for whether or not the project naturally generates a need to communicate. That's different from saying, does the project give students an opportunity to practice their language skills? Does it really require them to communicate in order to com complete the project, to communicate in the target language? Does it require all three modes of communication or is it just presentational communication? you'll find that with a lot of dessert projects, often it is just presentational communication. Um, and then uh, also is interpersonal communication really necessary as part of the project? Sometimes we forget about the culture. And so we don't include the pragmatic skills, uh, explicit instruction in the pragmatic skills that students need in order to communicate effectively in um, or with members of the target culture. So um, for this one, we need to start thinking about 
are we giving learners opportunities to observe interactions in the target culture and to reflect on those? Do we let them actually engage in interactions with people from target language communities? Do we ask them to compare and contrast in our project so that they start to develop a deeper understanding of cultural practices and perspectives and of cultural products and their relationship to how people think about language use and, um, and cultural engagement? And do they have opportunities to reflect critically and to critically interpret their personal cultural experiences? Um, all of those things require that learners have opportunities to learn how to be good learners of culture and that we specifically and strategically develop their skills um, in areas like pragmatics and what we mean by pragmatics will get defined um, even further in a, in a future model. But basically the, the kinds of skills that they need to do things like um, participate in conversations effectively, knowing when they can take the floor. How do you interrupt? How do you make a, a, a point or disagree in culturally appropriate ways? So it's basically the culturally appropriate use of the language. Sometimes we don't, for, don't uh, remember to connect learners to other disciplines. And that results in a project that doesn't really have the power it needs to keep them engaged in investigation or to motivate them to actually want to complete it. So having opportunities to acquire and interpret information, use academic content from other disciplines, and especially to look at the things that they're doing using career pathways that are of interest to them. And that's particularly relevant to those teaching in higher education settings. Um, if they don't have opportunities to really think about how the project connects to their own lives or their own experiences, it may lack personal meaning and relevance for them, which is kind of the source of most motivation. And if they don't have opportunities to um, compare and contrast and to use language in connection with um, target language communities, then the project doesn't really transfer out of the classroom and into students' lives. And that's where community partners and opportunities to collaborate with those community partners become important. In other words, sometimes we forget that authenticity means real. Real language, real materials, real purposes, real tasks and tools, real speakers, and opportunities to um, engage in language use in real places. In other words, um, it requires a lot of 21st century skills. And the more we think about explicitly giving students opportunities to participate in activities that require those skills, the more rich and meaningful their language use will be. So to conclude this lesson, when we think about developing a powerful project, we really need to be thinking about how do we design a meaningful context for communication? And that's different than saying, how do I take my content and teach it to students? If we're thinking about our job as not deliverer of content, but creator of, of uh, or orchestrator of meaningful learning environments and experiences, um, then the things that we're asking students to do have the power to actually transform them and the world in their lives. Um, and that means that our projects need to be cognitively challenging. They need to be emotionally engaging to students. So it's not good enough to just say, oh, I want a project, I, I want to do this project because it lets my students use all of these skills. We need to find the emotional hook in each project that students can get excited about. We need opportunities for uh, um, collaboration, which is the socially satisfying piece, and personal empowerment, where they really experience success as they go. And scaffolding will play a huge role in that. In other words, what moves students are things that are emotionally engaging and personally empowering. What transforms students are 
opportunities to think differently about the world and to do that in socially satisfying and supported ways. So hopefully you have enough information now that you can answer these three questions. Why is high quality PBL a powerful framework? What elements do high quality PBL projects share? And where they are likely to break down? And we will take questions um, for a few minutes before we shift to our next topic, which is where can you find successful project ideas and how do you craft powerful driving questions? <laughs> 